13 people have died from bites by the Sydney Funnel Whip. It's absolutely amazing that something that small with such a tiny little bit of venom can turn your body on itself. They're the ultimate thing, horrible spiders. Funnel web spiders, I'd have to be yeah, one of the classiest spiders around. Diabolical and disgusting. Scary things, aren't they? They just scare the living hell out of me. My city of Sydney Miss the warmth of you, miss the heart of your people. In the Sydney region, there are several million people living in the distribution of the Sydney funnel web. And it has the most toxic venom of any spider in the world. Before I came to Australia, I didn't even think about spiders. It was when I heard about all these horrible stories about funnel webs, and I was scared then. There have been over a dozen deaths from that, so clearly it's one of the world's most dangerous spiders. They're irritable, reactive, and they will strike with very little provocation. They're one of the few spiders that will happily fang you for no good reason. I noticed the light was off in the dining room and uh, I decided to change the glad before I went to bed. Because in doing so, I put my foot on the carpet and I fell a prick. It strikes downwards, like two daggers. And I said to myself, gee, that hurt. It's a nerve poison. We recognised it being a funnel web, but it was only the small one. You can get uh, symptoms arising centrally in 10 to 15 minutes. I could feel uh, my heart starting to race. A tongue twitching. I was breaking it into a, a sweat. Nausea, vomiting, dryness around the mouth, double vision, palpitations, increased blood pressure. I was getting a little bit fearful. Mentally confused, going to a coma. I clapped. Respiratory problems. And I was having an epileptic fit. And you die of asphyxia. I was emptying my stomach into my lungs and I was drowning. The funnel web has evolved over millions of years in this country. This country used to be lush rainforest. Millions of years have gone by. The funnel web is still here, living on in remnants of forest and rainforest. There is a species found in South Australia. It goes through Victoria, in Tasmania, all the way up the coast of New South Wales into Queensland. And there are many, many different species of funnel webs. And as time goes by, we'll find more. It was on this site, oh, 15 years ago now, that I found this spider and it reared up and it looked aggressive. We thought, gee, that's a funnel web spider. So I sent it away to the Australian Museum. And he said, look, Graham Wishart, you have got a new species of funnel web here living on your property. Can you find me a female? So here I was in the little forest nearby. I was digging away with my trowel, tracking this spider. And I had my left elbow tucked out like this and I felt a sharp pain pinprick. I looked up, lifted my elbow, and there's this darned Illawarra funnel web spider hanging on. I thought, heaven help me, I might be in trouble now. I rang my wife and said, look, uh, Gwenny, I've um, been bitten by a funnel web. I don't know what's going to happen. I'll let you know, just don't leave the phone. But I went for a swim and kept myself under observation and nothing happened at all. So I would say this particular species of funnel web we have here is not lethal, although I may not have got much venom. Why is the Sydney funnel web so venomous? Not clear. But this is a quirk, an unfortunate quirk, of the Sydney funnel web. If you happened to have had Sydney found it not where it is, but say down on the south coast, and have a perfectly innocuous little funnel web down there which wasn't bothering us at all, and funnel webs wouldn't have this notoriety. So it's uh, as much a geographic accident caused by Captain Phillip as anything else. So what you've got in the Sydney situation is a ring of big funnel web population concentrated on the upland areas. The more expensive the suburb, the greater the funnel web spider population. 
They have survived human habitation for 200 years. We're the people that are moving out and building our homes on their habitat. People are often amazed to think that they've built their house on a funnelweb colony, but they've always been there. It's, it's a fact of life. You know, there's only one way to deal with these buggers. <laughs> Funnelweb spiders are notorious. It is alleged for their jumping ability. And of course, this is quite untrue. When they're standing up there on the floor in front of you, in the rearing position, basically means that they are simply waiting to strike to defend themselves. And they can't do a thing in that position, they're virtually immobile. When they do get down on all eight legs again, they can run quite fast, and that worries people. The male is the quickest of the lot. This applies to most Mygalamore spiders, and Mygalamore spiders, by the way, include trapdoors and funnel webs, the whole group of them. They're very similar in appearance. The male moves so much quicker, I'll just give it a shove and see what happens. Come on now! <laughs> Funnelweb males only live for six to nine months after they become mature. Female lives for well, maybe ten years after she's matured. So in that six to twelve months it's got to wander about and find a mate. What would you do if one of these came into your place? Scream! Die. Oh, when you see him, you squash him. Kill him with a broom. <laughs> the male Sydney funnel web is six times more toxic than the female. Herein lies the whole problem with wandering males, males being more venomous and envenomation of people. What happens is that the wandering male looking for a female accidentally enters a garage or goes in under a door, something like this, and becomes trapped. When it finds itself in a house, it can't live for more than maybe 48 hours. But it's long enough for the householder to encounter it. One time we were in the house and like they all slid down, got into the towel, got in the hair, you know, scraped the head, didn't quite poison anyone, but did a bit of a scraping. So they can be a bit of a menace. Once the male is mature and he leaves the burrow, his main idea is finding the female and mating. Now what a funnel web does, and what all spiders do in fact when they mate, is they put out sperm from the pore on the abdomen. That little droplet of sperm is then sucked up into organs called palps on the front of the spider's body, just either side of the head. They're like little legs. But on the end of those little legs, there's a spine-like organ with a reservoir at the base. And this spine is used to transfer semen to the female. It's a funny way for spiders to do, for, for anybody to do business, but that's what spiders do. The spider wanders about with its palps charged and looks for a female. Now the females live in the burrows, and they hardly ever leave that burrow, unless perhaps they're washed out or dug up or something like that. The male wanders around looking for the female and they sort of smell the female. Probably the female puts out some sort of airborne scent which attracts the male to it. When he encounters the female, it's quite a, a long process of courtship to persuade the female to mate with him. It taps about on the silk around the entrance and it tracks the female up and what it's trying to do is establish the fact that it's not a meal, it's uh, potentially a mate. If it's acceptable, the female will come up and the male will then try and further establish its credentials by tapping on the female's abdomen. Once that is done, the female then does a rather odd thing. She rears up in the aggressive attitude, front legs up, and the male slips its second legs in over the second legs of the female. Now as soon as that happens, it seems that the female fully recognises the male as a mate 
and just basically relaxes. Nine times out of ten, she will kill and eat the male after mating. He never ever attempts to kill the female, but she will always do that to him. And that gives her nourishment while the eggs are developing, while she's laying the eggs, while she's caring for the egg sac, and uh, it's a ready source of, of available food. There is a strong symbology around spiders. In most societies, certain animals, plants, objects have a symbolic meaning. The typical one that we tend to think about are snakes, but spiders too are found as having symbolic meaning in a lot of indigenous societies. And the legend and the dreaming story goes there was a very, very beautiful um, dark and old woman there. And she would sit out on the edge of the rock and she would sing and it would go all over the valley. And the men really liked the sound of this, so it brought them up to see this woman. One at a time, they won a heart and she had babies to them. And then they would disappear. And no one knew where these young men went. And it was very, very strange. And the legend goes that they found her eating her husband, like the spiders do, right? And um, so they thought she was very dangerous and had to be gotten rid of. So what they did, they talked to the god of thunder and lightning. And what they devised was that one night when it started to rain, there was a terrible clap of thunder and a terrible big streak of lightning. And they knew at a certain time every night that she would be sitting there with the children. And when the clap of thunder came, it broke off the piece of rock and completely crushed her and her children. They got rid of her and every child that she bore there'd be no more spider one. That's the legend. I've often thought, I wonder if she's still under there. <laughs> like you thought. <laughs> I'm not going to look, brother. <laughs> For a lot of people, the spider really does represent something fearful and threatening. When I see a spider, I don't see what kind of spider it is. I see eight legs, and that to me is time to jump. The person would feel intense fear, um, very likely that they're going to die. They literally just scare the hell out of me. I just can't handle spiders. We're really talking about a high intensity panic attack or anxiety attack. Now, when I talk about panic attacks, it actually means that the person's going through very physiological symptoms like rapid breathing, often hyperventilating, they feel like they're going to faint and they look at whatever it is that they're afraid of and focus on it. And that in itself is a process that keeps feeding the fear because what now is within their field of vision, their perceptual field, is the very thing they're most scared of. And the funny thing is, is I'm a gardener and I deal with spiders all day. I come across them, you know, underneath sheets of metal and everything. I don't mind them as long as they're dead. What I do is when I see a spider, I've got to go up and kill it. I've, I've just got to go up and destroy the thing. If it's got all the legs, the funny body and the furry bits, they'll react. So I'll go up, tread on the spider, stand back, make sure it's not moving, it's dead. But I've got to be 100% sure that the thing's dead. So I'll go up and I'll just obliterate the spider. I'll just tread on it, squash it around until it's just in small little pieces. And when I find I'm happy with the spider, that I'm 100% sure it's dead then I'm fine, I can go ahead and do my work. When we look at someone who's phobic, is to look at how functional is that person's behaviour? How effectively does that allow that person to cope with everyday living? Now, if they're responding by, you know, waking up in the morning with this intense fear that there's a funnel web in their shoes, it's going to make life difficult. They've got this constant low-grade anxiety that they're going to encounter a spider, and then when they actually do, they quite often escalate towards panic. I think what's really important for people to look at in the fear of spiders is really how they're relating to themselves. You know, a lot of what we see in the world is actually a projection of what's happening for us inside. 
So if we feel good about ourselves, we'll tend to see the world as being a, a less threatening place. But suddenly we see all these little hairy spiders and are really scared of them. I think one of the questions you need to ask yourself is, do I really see myself as being someone who's helpless, who's you know, disempowered, who can't effectively control my environment? Well, I first decided to do my cartoon book, A Little Nest of Funnel Webs, uh, when we moved to the Northern Beaches. And uh, we found out very soon that it was crawling with funnel web spiders. We were virtually living on a carpet of funnel web spiders. And uh, as a result, paranoia set in in a big way. And I guess probably the book was a uh, uh, an attempt to exorcise the paranoia that I was <laughs> undergoing through living with all of these animals. When we look at Peter Meldrum, who turned it all around, made it funny for himself, that way exercised his fear, that was a healthy approach, dealing with, what, two and a half million funnel webs in his backyard. I love funnels. <laughs> I just don't, just don't know why they're on this earth. I mean, everything's here for some reason or other, but I have no idea what they're here for. You can't talk about the funnel web in isolation. It's part of an ecosystem of other large spiders, all of which are predators. Now, the funnel web is a generalised predator. It's not particularly specialised on any sort of prey. Some of them appear to take softer body prey, like cockroaches, but uh, also pretty well anything from insects up to small vertebrates. So a funnel web will happily take small frogs, uh, small lizards.